Yamaguchi was a small village in the mountains, Matsu said. He often visited to deliver supplies to a friend. We walked the two miles or so up a narrow, rocky, brush-lined dirt road. Ahead of us, I could see the hilly slopes and large pine trees, which could easily cover up any signs of life. Yamaguchi is also called the Village of Lepers, Matsu said, as we walked slowly up the road. When some of those who had the disease were no longer wanted by others in town, they took what few belongings they had and went up into the mountains, hoping to die peacefully, away from the cruelties of the healthy. Aren't you afraid to go there? I asked hesitantly. Matsu walked straight ahead. I thought he wasn't going to answer when he suddenly looked right at me and said, The first time I went, I wasn't sure what to expect. After all, lepers from all over Japan found their way to Yamaguchi, simply hoping to be accepted, to be swallowed up by the mountain. Matsu looked down at the path again and then walked on. I began to visit a friend there, someone from my youth. No one knew. I was young and healthy, and I remember being told long ago by a visiting doctor that there was nothing to fear. Leprosy wasn't a disease that could be spread by simple contact. When Matsu's voice stopped, I realized he was several steps ahead of me and had turned to wait for me to catch up. I felt a shortness of breath as I drew in more air and let out several long sighs. I'm fine, I said, increasing my pace and moving past Matsu up the hill. Maybe we should visit another day, Matsu said, raising his voice to make sure I heard. I stopped and turned back to him. I'm really fine, I said, with such conviction that Matsu caught up, then continued up the path alongside of me. The village of Yamaguchi stood in a clearing on the gradual slope of the mountain, hidden away by tall pine trees. Small wooden houses sat in a cluster like any other village. I stopped at the outskirts and let my eyes wander over the tranquil site. From the distance, the villagers appeared just like Matsu and me. Men were gathered in small groups, sipping tea and talking, while others worked in small gardens and women sat mending clothes. Only with closer scrutiny did I begin to see that the houses were painstakingly pieced together with mismatched scraps of wood. And while some villagers had their heads and hands bandaged, others freely displayed their raw scabs and open wounds. I felt a strange curiosity rather than fear. In China, lepers had always been feared and shunned. I had heard stories of how they were forced to live on the streets, left to beg or eat rats, while they simply rotted away. I stood a long time, taking it all in. When I finally came out of my trance, Matsu was studying my face, my face with an unusual intensity. He continued to watch me and finally said, You don't have to be afraid. I wouldn't have brought you here if there were any danger. I smiled at his concern. I'm afraid for them, I said, quick to cover my cough. Matsu laughed, then pointed toward the far end of the village. My friend's house is that way, he said. We walked slowly through the village. There was a distinct smell of eucalyptus and something else medicinal. For the first time in my life, I saw what it meant to be a leper, a disgraced one. They seemed to watch me with just as much curiosity. I tried not to stare, but I couldn't take my eyes off their wounds, the missing fingers and toes, the large gaping holes in the sides of their faces, the mangled features that had once been noses and ears. It looked as if they were all wearing monstrous masks that I kept waiting for them to remove. Matsu must have understood my thoughts. He suddenly stopped, turned to me, and said, Most of them came to this village as young men and women. Now they are too old and set in their ways to move. Even though the Japanese government has acknowledged their situation and would gladly move them to better facilities, good or bad, Yamaguchi has been their home. I watched as Matsu then nodded and exchanged pleasantries with several of the villagers. From some doorways, I could also smell the strong, sweet aroma of tea, which filled me and my parched throat with longing. Who is this handsome young man, Matsu, one man asked, 
taking a few steps closer. His right arm was a gnarled, raw stump, which looked like it had been eaten away. The son of Maidana Sama, my master, Matsu answered, walking on without a pause. I smiled at all of them self-consciously, then followed Matsu as if he were the master. We walked to the far end of the village, where there were few houses and the pine trees thickened. Matsu slowed down as we approached a small, sturdier-looking house, almost hidden among the trees. Who lives here? I asked, catching my breath. A friend, Matsu answered. As he led me toward the house, I noticed how his steps lightened, his body relaxed, and he seemed almost young again. I stood behind Matsu as he tapped three times on the door and waited, blowing air through his teeth to create a small whistling sound. I'd never seen Matsu so exuberant and was curious to see who lived there. Within moments, the door opened just enough for a head, veiled in black, to peek out. Sachi-san, it's me, Matsu said gently. The woman stepped back and opened the door wider, allowing the sunlight to brighten the clean, spare, white room behind her. She looked away from Matsu toward me and held her place behind the door. Matsu, she said softly, watching me closely. Matsu glanced back at me, then said, This is Stephen's son. He's a friend. Konnichiwa, I said, smiling and bowing, trying to put her at ease. The woman stepped back and bowed humbly. Matsu entered the small house and, with a slight wave of his hand, urged me to follow. I did, anxious to know more about the timid woman who lived within it. The room smelled of the pine branches which sat in a vase on a low table in one corner. Next to the vase were two small, shiny black stones. Other than the table and a few cushions neatly stacked to the side, the room was bare. I didn't know you would come today, Matsu, the woman said, keeping her head bowed low so I couldn't see her face under the black scarf. Her voice was soft and hesitant. It was a nice day to take a walk. Anyway, since when do I need an invitation to visit you, Sachi, Matsu said teasingly. Sachi laughed, looking down and away from Matsu. I will bring some tea, she then said shyly. She adjusted the black scarf so that it covered her face as she turned to leave the room. Is she? I asked without completing my sentence. Matsu walked to the window and looked out. Yes, he said softly. She's a leper. We stood so quietly for a few moments that the muted sounds coming from the kitchen filled the room. It was strange to be standing in a different house with Matsu, seeing him for the first time in a new light. He seemed gentler less in command. This is a nice house, I finally said. Matsu nodded his approval. Sachi returned, carrying a tray of tea and crackers. When we were seated on the cushions, I looked up to examine the face of our hostess. She was older than I had first thought, with a slender build and quick movements. When Sachi leaned forward to serve the strong green tea, her black scarf slipped a little from the left side of her face. Underneath, I could see where the ulcers had eaten away her flesh, leaving white, scaly scabs, creating a disfigured mass as she, her half-closed left eye strained to open. When she saw my gaze, Sachi quickly looked down and recovered the side of her face. As far as I could see, only her face and left hand seemed affected by the disease. Her smooth, white, right hand and fingers were untouched. More tea, she asked, beginning to rise. Please, I answered, my face flushed and embarrassed. Matsu rose quickly before her and said, let me get it, disappearing into the kitchen before Sachi had time to say anything. Very slowly, she lowered her body back down onto the cushion and turned just enough so that only the right side of her face was exposed to me. While the left side of her face had been devastated, the unblemished right side was the single most beautiful face I had ever seen. I hope we're not disturbing you, I said, my voice sounding young and eager. Sachi shook her head. 
She turned a bit more to get a good look at me with her one good eye. I don't have many visitors, only Matsu-san. Often years will go by without my seeing a new face. I am honored to have you visit. Then I was the one who seemed shy, not knowing what to say to this very beautiful woman. It seemed we already had something in common in our loneliness. I tried to imagine what Pi would do in my situation, but realized she might just ask to see what was under the black scarf. Sachi must have sensed my discomfort because she was the one to continue the conversation. The words flowed from her with ease. The last time Matsu came, he told me you were staying at the beach house for a while, she said. I haven't been well. My parents thought it might be better for me to be away from Hong Kong and my younger sister while I'm recuperating. They're hoping the fresh air of Tarumi will help me. Sachi pulled the black scarf tighter across her left side. Yes, Tarumi can be a cure for some and a refuge for others. What's a refuge, Matsu asked, walking heavily out of the kitchen, carrying a pot of tea. Sachi looked toward him and smiled. The beauty of Tarumi, she answered. She quickly rose from her cushion and bowed her head. Matsu, let me see if I need anything for the garden. We both watched in silence as Sachi slid open the shohi door and disappeared. By the time we were ready to leave Sachi's house, it was late afternoon. I was filled with tea and crackers, happy that Sachi had relaxed and grown comfortable in my presence. I would be honored if you would come and visit me again, Sachi said. She stood at the door and pulled her scarf closer to her face. I will, I smiled. I glanced toward Matsu. There's no need to wait for Matsu, she said. You are always welcome. I bowed and said, Domo arigato gozaimasu. Matsu watched us and smiled. Then before he turned to leave, he gently touched Sachi's arm. Matsu and I walked through the village, saying very little. The same villagers sat playing cards or smoking in small, scattered groups. They were less interested in us this time, though Matsu lifted his hand and gestured to several of the men along the way. Our walk back down the mountain was quick and quiet. Only when we reached the beach road that led back to the house did I gather the courage to speak. Sachi-san is very nice, I said. Matsu nodded his head in agreement, then added, She was once one of the most beautiful girls in all of Terumi, perhaps all of Japan. How did she catch it? I asked, hesitantly. The leprosy? Matsu shook his head. It was like a wildfire back then. It couldn't be stopped once it began. When did it happen? Matsu slid his hand through his short gray hair. I watched his brow wrinkle in thought as sweat glistened and slowly made its way down the side of his face. It must have been at least 40 years ago or so when it first appeared in Tarumi, he finally answered. I don't know what brought the cursed disease to us. We had never seen it before, but maybe it was always incubating, waiting like a smoldering fire to spread out. One day, it began to show its ugly face, and there was nothing we could do. The disease chose randomly, infecting our young and old. My father never told us anything about it. He never knew, Matsu continued eagerly, as if it was a story he'd long held inside and could finally unleash. It was kept quiet among the local villagers. After all, Tarumi was a place for outsiders to come on holiday. If they'd heard about the disease, no one would return. We didn't want to frighten anyone away until we knew more about it. At first, no one had any idea what was happening. Then a few more became infected with the scaly patches. It first appeared like a rash, only it wouldn't go away. Within months, it began to eat up the victim's hand or face. Matsu paused and swallowed. Fortunately, there was a young doctor visiting Tarumi who tried, without much success, to reassure us that the disease couldn't be spread by simple touch. We wanted to listen and learn, but those first few months were like a bad dream. Every day, people awoke, afraid the leprosy would claim them. Some of those suffering from the disease quickly left the village. 
while others ended their lives hoping not to dishonor their families. Was your family all right? Matsu was silent. The road had become familiar again with bamboo-fenced houses and trees. We were almost home. I could smell the salt from the ocean and feel its mist on my face. I waited for him to go on. It took my younger sister, Tomoko, Matsu finally said. I hesitated, remembering what my father had said about her accident. I wanted to know more, but Matsu had quickened his pace as we neared the house. Instead, I asked, Why did you take me with you to Yamaguchi? Matsu slowed, then turned to face me before he answered, So you would know that you're not alone. This morning, I decided to paint the view of the garden from my grandfather's study. When I first arrived in Tarumi, I wondered how Matsu could spend so much time in the garden. But the more time I spend here, the easier it is to see there's something very seductive about what Matsu has created. Once, when I asked him to name a few blossoms for me, the words curia, lespedeza, crepe myrtle, seemed to flow from his lips in one quick breath. The garden is a world filled with secrets. Slowly, I see more each day. The black pines twist and turn to form graceful shapes, while the moss is a carpet of green that invites you to sit by the pond. Even the stone lanterns, which dimly light the way at night, allow you to see only so much. Matsu's garden whispers at you, never shouts. It leads you down a path hoping for more, as if everything is seen, yet hidden. There's a quiet beauty here I only hope I can capture on canvas. After Michiko-san passed away, another part of my life in Yamaguchi began. Matsu started building me this house so I would have a place of my own away from the others, yet close enough to the village in case I needed help. Whenever he stayed in Yamaguchi, Matsu was at work on the house before I rose each morning. I helped him as much as I could, and it was in the simple act of driving a nail into wood or putting a shohi screen into place that I would end each day too tired to feel sorry for myself. I think it was also a way for Matsu to communicate with me. He has always felt more comfortable working with his hands and I have never seen him so relaxed as he described each step of building the house. Sachi, he told me, the windows should be placed here so that the warmth of the sun will stay into the evening. We could plant a silk tree there later if it becomes too much. It was only natural that Matsu would want to plan for a garden. Please, Matsu-san, I told him, not long after the house was completed, I don't wish to have any flowers. Never once did he question me. I needed my life to be simple, without any beauty to remind me of all I had lost. And though I had not told him that, Matsu must have seen it in my eyes. Don't worry, Sachi, he said. There will be no flowers. He left early the next morning, after the house was completed, saying he would be back some time in the afternoon. I slowly tried to adapt to my new home in Yamaguchi, yet I kept to myself. With Michiko gone, the thought of being alone still frightened me. I couldn't yet bring myself to be with anyone else. Even the thought of my own family seemed distant, belonging to another life. And you have seen what kind of garden Matsu made for me. He returned that afternoon, carting two bags of gray, palm-sized flat stones. The next weeks were spent clearing the land and planning what would be placed where. I've never seen Matsu so excited as the day we began to lay the stones down carefully, side by side, until we had formed a rippling pattern. It will be a garden created from your imagination, he said, urging me to rearrange the stones any way I wanted them to be. Stevenson, I spent hours rearranging those stones as if they held some strange, mesmerizing power that brought me calm. 
Day after day, Matsu carried bags of pebbles and stones of different shapes and sizes up here with the help of a borrowed mule and cart. I anxiously awaited them, as if I were trying to fit each piece together into a complicated puzzle I needed to finish. I felt as if I had fallen into a trance, which I couldn't come out of until the garden was completed. With Matsu's help and patience, I had created something from the most common elements, and when the garden was finally finished, I realized for the first time in my life that I had accomplished something. What I had thought would be barren and distant was instead filled with quiet beauty. I remember I turned to Matsu as we stood looking at the rock garden and asked, Did you know it would be so simple and beautiful? I knew its beauty would appear if we worked hard enough, he answered. But I never expected it to be like this. Matsu smiled. Beauty can be found in most places. I turned to face him, really looking for the first time at his thick, strong features. They were so different from Tomoko's, I thought again that they couldn't really be related. After a moment, I said, I thought I no longer had any desire for beauty. I've had it all my life, and look what it's done for me. Matsu then shook his head, looking out toward the garden. Sachi-san, you've only known the ordinary kind of beauty, which appears on the outside. Perhaps you now desire something deeper. I wanted to say something back to him, and I knew deep down that he was right, though I didn't have the words yet. Until that disease chose me, I had lived a life, a charmed life of grace and ease, while Matsu had always to work hard for what he desired. He has always known where beauty comes from. Later on, when the disease spread over the left side of my face, I tried to accept the burden placed on me, to tell myself that real beauty comes from deep within. But I'm afraid sometimes I reverted back to my spoiled ways. But, Stevenson, can you imagine what it was like to watch your own face slowly transformed into a monster? Have you ever awakened in the morning from a series of nightmares, feeling, fearing what you might have turned into during the night? I will not lie to you and tell you that it was easy. There were times when I thought I could actually feel my skin shrinking, pulling against my bones and muscles, slowly suffocating me. Matsu comforted me as much as he could by having me work on the house or in the garden, but no matter how much pleasure I found in them, they were still cold and inanimate. I longed for my past life. Matsu always knew that the peace of mind I needed could only be found within myself. About the same time, Kenzo suspected something was going on because of the supplies Matsu constantly needed. He began to send food and messages to me. Yet, tins of pickled cabbage or a chicken couldn't replace the fact that Kenzo would never be able to face me again. I was in my early twenties by the time the garden was completed. I remember it being the end of summer, and Matsu had to return to Tarumi for several days to help his father. I missed him terribly and found myself unable to sleep. We had become so close. I began pacing the floor like a caged animal. Each day I grew increasingly filled with anger and rage at this disease which was consuming my life. How could I stand the loneliness of Yamaguchi? How could I continue to live as an outcast? Dark thoughts of ending my life again entered my mind. Then something strange occurred. A strong wind began rattling the house, and I was suddenly compelled to go out into the garden, the wind calling me. I opened the shohi screen and stepped out into its embrace, soothed by the still gray rocks. I remember how I stood there in my bare feet, the dull sensation of the stones pushing and crackling beneath my feet. It was like a dream to think I had worked for months to create it, only to finally realize what was in front of me. In that moment, it all came to life. Suddenly, I could hear the water flowing and see the soft ripples on its surface. But most of all, 
I could now relish the fact that its beauty was one that no disease or person could ever take away from me. I stood there for a long time until I felt like I was no longer myself at all, but part of the garden.